G'day everybody, I'm the scavenger. You can hold your applause. It is time to find out if Johnson Heights Church indeed has what it takes to confront the elements and find things out in the real world. We have sent families out into the rockiest of conditions, out into the dangerous streets of Surrey in the pouring rain. Will they make it? Some might not. The competition will be fierce, but those who emerge victorious will be crowned scavengers. So first up, Show me somebody at a McDonald's. Show me some dance moves like one of those car dealership balloons. <laughs> Show me a superhero stance in front of a movie theater. Show me your best yoga poses because it's great to get some rest and relaxation after some hard one scavenging. Let's see how you can embrace nature. More passion for nature. Locate for me, Mike Marfori. Can I get some musical accompaniment out on these streets? A, B, C, D, E, F, G. Jingle bells, jingle bells, jingle all the way. Show me what it takes to fill up the gas. Show me the best Beatles album cover. All this joy and fun is abounding. Send me a rap about your surroundings. Running through the grasses and sniffing buttercups. I love this area so, so much. There's a cool basketball court in the skating park. And it's really, really wet because it's raining outside. And there's some green and some white and the soccer net. And there's fences and it's green. And there's a tree and it's wide. Yo, 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 we out on the street. The rain is coming down. There's a green fence around and I don't know what else to say, but it's a rainy day. You have all performed admirably. I can confidently say that you are all scavengers through and through. Thank you all for coming out. It was great to see you all in person. We hope to have more events coming up in the future. Until next time, keep scavenging. Hey everyone, it's so great to be here uh, with you and uh, getting ready to worship together. Um, I just want to introduce this new song uh, to you, Graves into Gardens, um, and just tell you a little bit about why we're seeing it. Um, just these uh, past few weeks as I've been you know, preparing, God's been really speaking to me um, just about how He is not only an able God, able to do anything and far more than we can ever imagine, but uh, how He is better than anything, um, better 
better than anything this world can offer us or, or give us or do for us. And uh, this song just speaks so much to that. And, uh, you know, our God is, you know, he's a life giver. He's the sea splitter. He's the, he's death defeater. Um, and so is anything too hard for our God? Uh, and so let's worship together. the world but it couldn't fill me man's empty praise and treasures that fade are never enough and you came along and put me back together
Hi, my name is John Thiessen. I'm the lead pastor here at Johnson Heights Church. I want to thank you for joining us today. As we begin, I want to make you aware that Darren Butte is currently in a candidacy process for the position of youth and young adults director. He's had a very full few days here in the Lower Mainland. He's met 
with various teams. He's met with the staff at the church. He's met the pastoral team. He's met the youth staff, and he's met some of the young adults and the youth students that are part of our youth ministry program. And so as part of the message today, I want us to hear his testimony, which was recorded earlier this week. Hi, I'm Darren. Um, I'm from Montreal, Quebec. Uh, right now I live in Lloydminster, Alberta, and uh, I'm hopefully going to be um, the new youth and young adults director here at Johnston Heights Church. Uh, I grew up in a non-Christian home. Um, faith was not something that we talked about in my home, um, but I have a brother who's 10 years older than I am, and when he was 18, he became a born-again Christian. And he came home, and spoke to me about the gospel, explained to me that Jesus died for my sins, that he was buried and rose again after three days, and, and that uh, as a result of his resurrection, uh, that I could have a relationship with the creator of the universe. And, and at the time, it, in my mind, it was about going to heaven. It was uh, about not going to hell, but um, just es escaping the punishment of my sin. And, and so I became a Christian because it sounded like a good deal. Um, and I started going to church, I started going to Sunday school, started uh, attending youth group, but I was one of those guys that had one foot in the church, one foot out of the church, and, and, and so I was getting involved in parties and stuff when I was a teenager, kind of getting involved in, in the things that the world says is acceptable for teenagers to get involved in, and I, I was really starting to, to loathe myself and, and, and everyone around me. I was starting to become really angry and, and full of hate, um, and I remember by the time I was 17, I was in a pretty dark place. Um, and I was hanging out with some friends one day when I was 17 who were also Christians, or at least we were all going to youth group together. And we were hanging out and we were talking about how hard it was to talk to our friends about Jesus. And I, I remember when I vocalized that, I, I heard a voice um, say to me, how can you talk about me if you don't live for me? And I broke. Uh, I broke down and I said, God, I don't live for you. And if you're real and if you're if if this life is the life that it's supposed to be, then I want to give my life to you and, and you make it better because I hate what I'm what I am right now. And and on that day, uh, in October of 1993, I, I, I gave my life to Jesus and um, became a completely different man. Um, my world flipped upside down. When I gave my life to Jesus, uh, hope became a thing in my life. There, there was purpose in my life. I, I, I actually had a reason um, to exist. I, I, I was now put on a mission, and, and that, was, that was something that I didn't have before. I, I, I really, you know, wrestling with that question of why am I here and what's my purpose in life, like a lot of us go through, right? And, and um, I found it. I found it in Jesus. And, and it's so far beyond even who I am and what I am that it's 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 incredible. Um, this this life that I'm now on isn't my own. Yet at the same time, it's the most fulfilling life I could ever live. And so that's yeah, it's pretty wild. When I was about 20 years old. Um, I, I had just finished a year of Bible college and I, I felt God calling me to go work uh, at a, a summer camp, a Bible camp. And, and my brother, who, who was my, you know, my spiritual father and my spiritual uh, influence, he was like, no, you need a job and you need to make some money to pay for Bible college. And, and so he's like, I got you a job at the factory that I work at. And so I, I went to work and, and within four days, I walked up to the manager and I was like, I'm sorry, but I made a promise to somebody that I need to keep, I quit. And, and that was huge for me because it meant, um, number one, disappointing my, my brother, who, who honestly was a father figure to me. And, um, and I also put his name on the line because he, you know, he did that to get me the job. But my call from God, I, I honestly felt that I had to answer it. And so I, I went to this camp and the first week was training week and things were going so well and so amazingly um, that I was like, this is it. This is, the, God, I knew this is what you wanted me to do. And the second week came and that was teen week. Um, it was high school camp. 
And it, the first night was the worst night I've ever experienced. No one was listening to me. Kids were rude and disrespectful. I had one kid in my cabin almost die because other kids were about to kill him and I had to step in. It was intense. Uh, and, and I remember going to chapel and just being so frustrated and so angry that I had to leave chapel um, because I, I was just so angry. And I, and I walked down to the beach and I could still hear the singing and stuff. And, and I was like, God, I'm leaving. This is not what you want. And this is not what I want. And I'm out of here. And I remember picking up my Bible and, and reading this passage that I, I can't even find to this day. So I don't even know if I actually read it or not. But um, it talked about hearing God's children singing and looking to the mountains. And so here I am, here I am at the lake, looking at the mountains, hearing God's kids singing out praises to him. And, and I, I, I hear God's voice again. And he says, Darren, this is what I want you to do for the rest of your life. I want you to work with teenagers. And it was not what I wanted to hear. And, and I had to make a choice. I could either choose to accept that and follow that and, and lean into where God is calling me and, and do that, or I could walk away. But if I'm walking away, I'm walking away from God completely. And, and so, um, again, I came to the realization that I can't walk away from Jesus because Jesus is real. And the very next day, there were a couple of kids who got caught smoking dope and they were getting kicked out of the camp. And so I asked the director of the camp if I could spend the day hanging out with them while they were waiting for their parents to pick them up. And, and he was like, yeah, absolutely. And, and so I spent the day with them and, and had like some one-on-one -on -one conversations and, and just really talked about faith with them. Uh, and, and it was fine, it was great, and they left. Halfway through the summer, I got an, a letter in the mail and it was one of those youth kids that I had talked to and they had said that they had changed their life, that they had given their lives to Jesus and then they were following Jesus and this summer had been amazing for them in their pursuit of Jesus and it was all because of our conversation that we had and I was blown away. Um, it was the first time that I actually thought I could impact somebody's life for, for Christ and and it, it fueled me to pursue this seriously. And, and, and so that was kind of like the very first steps of my becoming uh, a youth pastor. And, and as the years went on, God just kind of brought me into these different situations where I ended up, you know, working with teenagers uh, until I became a full-time youth pastor. The, the thing I'm most passionate about in youth ministry is, is when kids get it, when kids understand the gospel and what that can actually mean for their lives. Um, there's nothing better than that. It's what I live for. Uh, I'm, I'm very passionate about making disciples of Christ who make disciples of Christ who make disciples of Christ. You know, this is an unending thing. We're on a mission to reach the world and, and God has put us on this and it's, it, that's so exciting. And so when, when I see kids get that, when I see kids understand that um, Christ died for them and that he rose so that they could have a life that is full and that is um, beyond anything that they could achieve for themselves, that that is incredible I, I love that so so much and and so um having an opportunity to be a part of people's lives as they figure out faith and as i walk beside them um there's nothing better than that uh, that that's that's what gets me up in the morning Well, tonight there's going to be a q a time with darren over zoom happening at 7 p.m the link for this is posted in our website. I would encourage you to go there and to join us. Our website is hopetoyou.com. Uh, find the tab uh, where it says candidate and you'll find the link there for the Q&A session tonight. Uh, plan to join us and you'll get a chance to uh, hear him answer some questions and to ask him some questions to get to know him a little bit more. Uh, just a reminder that there is a congregational vote happening on Wednesday night at 7 p.m. July 22nd, that's this Wednesday, and it's gonna be a hybrid congregational meeting. And so please, if you haven't already members, you need to RSVP for this, this meeting by responding to the email that was sent to you by indicating how you intend to join. And so the vote for this meeting is going to happen uh, by paper ballot on site, and it's also gonna happen by secure electronic ballot 
uh, that will be provided at the meeting for those participating over Zoom. The vote will be for both Josephine Papp, who is the candidate for the administrative director position, and for Darren Butte, who is the candidate for the youth and young adults director position. So please, the main thing here is that, that we would be continuing to pray through this entire process. What we want more than anything else is for the Lord's will to be done. And we know from scripture that when we pray and we call out to him that God does hear us and he does respond, that is the most important thing right now is for us to be praying as a church. Pray that God would direct very clearly through Johnson Heights and in the hearts of Josephine and in Darren that they would know where God is leading. So please, uh, let's pray about that. And I thought let's begin today by prayer. So Lord, thank you so much for Darren and for Lynn and for the two girls. Lord, thank you for their time here that we got to meet them. And Lord, we just pray for them that you would be speaking very clearly in their hearts where you're leading. Lord, we pray this as well for Josephine as she considers the role of administrative director. And Lord, I pray for us as a church that you would give us clear direction. Lord, we thank you that you are a God who guides and who provides and who honors prayer. And so, Lord, we want to begin saying that your way is best. Lord, we have open hands and we just look to you. So please come and guide and direct. And Lord, we pray that also as we open your word today, would you open our minds, would you open our hearts, help us to know you, help us to fall more deeply in love with you as we open your word together. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. So today we're looking at one of Paul's old friends, and we're going to dig into some conflict between them. I find that as people hear this word conflict, that there's a couple of different responses. There's a flight or a fight response that's fairly typical. Uh, there's those around us who feel like, you know, bring it on. Like, I'm ready for confrontation. I'm ready for conflict. And there's those of us who feel like, nope, <laughs> I, do, I don't want anything to do with conflict. Uh, it causes anxiety and stress just even thinking about it. And so obviously I'm minimizing all the research and study that's gone into this topic, but I think the majority of us would identify somewhere with one of these two responses, a fight or a flight uh, response to this. And so when Ange, my wife Ange and I uh, do premarital counseling, which we've done for several couples, we spend a significant amount of time talking about conflict management because in every relationship where people are actually loving each other and committed to each other, there's going to be conflict at some point. And so conflict can happen for all sorts of reasons, including lack of communication, lack of trust, feeling underappreciated or disrespected, uh, having value conflicts, having lack of effective or uneven leadership or decision-making, or unresolved prior conflicts. And there's more than this, but these are some of the main ones that come up which sometimes trigger or cause conflict to happen. And so as we look at Paul's friendship today, we're returning to a friend we have looked at already and his name is Barnabas. And so my argument with Barnabas a few weeks ago was that this was a guy who included Paul and walked alongside of him. He was a great friend for these reasons. But now here we see a bit of a different picture. And what I, want, what I love, honestly, I love most about this um, is that it's so real life. Uh, you and I probably have had conflict. I'm, I think it's a safe assumption with people. There isn't this sort of flat, idealistic perspective or presentation of their friendship between Paul and Barnabas. It seems actually kind of real. Okay, I can connect with that. You know, and that's what's presented to us today. And so I want us to first of all read about this conflict which occurs and it's in Acts chapter 15. Please turn there. And then I want to dig into our own Christian relationships and see what we can learn. So I'm gonna read Acts 15 verse 36 to 41 and then we're gonna talk about this. This is what it says. Sometime later, Paul said to Barnabas, let us go back and visit the believers in all the towns where we preach the word of the Lord and let's see how they're doing. 
Barnabas wanted to take John, also called Mark, with them, but Paul did not think it wise to take him because he had deserted them in Pamphylia and had not continued with them in the work. They had such a sharp disagreement, this is Paul and Barnabas, had such a sharp disagreement that they actually parted company. And Barnabas took Mark and sailed for Cyprus, but Paul chose Silas and left, commended by the believers to the grace of the Lord. And so he went through Syria and Cilicia, strengthening the churches. And so here's a picture of the conflict that takes place. And it's interesting because if you read some commentaries on this to get their perspective, there's different theories on on this this incident. Uh, People come to different conclusions. Some people think that Paul was right and Barnabas was wrong. Other people think that Barnabas was right and Paul was wrong. Some people think that both of them were wrong. And other people think that, no, 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 both of them were actually right. And so often the Bible is simply descriptive of events. It's not um, always entirely prescriptive. And I love that about the Bible. You can just sort of read about real life. It just happens here. And I think it's one of those situations. There's an incident that took place. It was significant and it's simply recorded. But I think there's things that we can learn through this. But here's the bottom line. Paul and Barnabas, they had a disagreement. That's the first thing. They, number two, they, they, the dis- their disagreement was over a person. It was over John Mark. The third thing is it was big enough of a disagreement that they actually parted company. And the fourth thing is that ultimately the, the work continued on. It continued to happen. It seems to have happened actually with God's blessing in some ways. And so those are the four bottom line things that I, I take from my observation of this incident. Now, I sometimes when I, I think we hear stories like this, we want to kind of skip over them. And I don't know if you've ever read like a children's Bible and it's sort of like all flowers and roses and it skips over these massive events. This is one of the incidences that would be skipped over in your children's Bible. And honestly, I feel like skipping over it sometimes too because I can't really wrap my head around it. Why is that there? I just want to think about the good times between Paul and Barnabas. But there's this middle section here that I think we should camp on. We we should really think about and sit in a little bit. It actually, at a future date, it seems like Barnabas and Paul actually reconcile that they mend things. And you can, you can see this in a letter that Paul writes to the church in Corinth in 1 Corinthians 9, verse 6. Paul actually speaks favorably about Barnabas. But there's this middle section here uh, in between their first 15 years, actually, of really good friendship and what seems to have concluded to be a good friendship. There's this middle section here uh, where some things are taking place. And what we learn from this ultimately is that great friendships actually do have conflict. They have conflict. And I think that's okay. Proverbs 27 verse 6 says that wounds from a friend can be trusted, but an enemy multiplies kisses. Let me say that again. The wounds of a friend can be trusted, but an enemy multiplies kisses. And so an enemy flatters you to your face and then stabs you in the back. But a great friend stabs you in the front. Wounds of a friend can be trusted. And so I don't know if you've experienced that before. Imagine you have. I have definitely experienced this in my life and probably one of the most dramatic stories that I could tell you. And I've told this before in the past, but I want to say it again because it's so meaningful. Uh, When I was about 18 years old, I got my very first full-time job working construction. And my brother got me the job. My brother is about four years older than me. And so I was working downtown Vancouver in a high-rise building and with a construction company and the, the company had gutted an entire floor and re- rebuilding all of it, reframing it, re-drywalling it, putting in new carpet, putting in new doors, making a new office space. And so I got my first full-time job there. I was working away and uh, it was hard work. It was long hours. Uh, it was dusty with the drywall dust and we worked with insulation. It was scratchy. If you ever worked with that before? It wasn't really a pleasant job and I was working a lot of hours. 
And so we sat down together and took our lunch break and all the workers were around and the foreman was also there and he was trying to recruit people to work on Saturday, which we weren't obligated to do. We were working Monday to Friday. This would be overtime. And he looked around the room and asked and eventually came to me and said, John, do you want to work on Saturday? And I kind of looked at him and thought about it. And well, I had plans because I was 18 and I had, I had places to see. I had, I had places to go. And so I, you know, I, I told him like, well, thanks for the offer, but I actually have some plans this weekend. You know, and so we finished eating lunch and I had noticed my brother's body language kind of shift. You know, a lot of communication is, is nonverbal. And when I had said that, I kind of looked at him, his body language shifted a little bit. I didn't understand completely why, but I found out after lunch. So lunch ended and we all went back to our various places we were working. And I was working alone in this office room that had been drywalled. The door was on. I was sweeping up the floor and picking up pieces of drywall, getting screws off the ground and just doing a general clean. And then my brother burst through the door and I could tell that he was not happy. I didn't know why, but he basically charged up to me and hit me in the chest with his forearm and pinned me against the wall and just held me there and stared into my eyes and said, John, what are you doing? You are just given a full-time job. And when your foreman asks you if you want to work on Saturday, you work on Saturday. How could you possibly do what you just did. Now get out there and apologize to him and tell him that you'll work Saturday and you'll work as much time as needed to get this job done. And I, I was like, I couldn't believe it. But you know, I was kind of shaken by that a little bit. You know, my brother's bigger than I was, but uh, it was done from a place of love and he was right. You know, it's, you should never start a new job and just sort of treat it casually. You know, you got to earn your place on the team and it's important to work hard. And so I went to the foreman and I, I said, hey, I'm, I'm sorry. You know what? Um, my plan suddenly <laughs> changed. My Saturday became open. Can I work for you? Is the, is the offer still there? And, you know, I learned something that day. I, I learned how important it was to, uh, to, to start off on the right foot and, and to really just put your head down and work hard. And our family just so values a hard work and work ethic. But it was my brother who pointed that out to me and he's a great friend and he still is. But that was, that was hurtful. Well, not only just the forearm to the chest, but the, the confrontation was quite painful. But he was right. And I think that um, I, not only did I keep my job, but I think I'm better for it today as a result of that confrontation. You know, I was talking to my wife, Ange, about this, this passage of scripture. And she said, you know, I got friends. I got friends who wound me as well, you know, and uh, she says she's got lots of uh, friends in her life that would wound her, and uh, it, it sounds harsh, but these women in her life, she says, are some of her closest friends before the wounds and after the wounds, and she says that they're willing to do, uh, to ask the hard questions, honestly, uh, to point her to a higher calling, to a higher purpose in her life, and some of the questions that her great friends ask her are questions like this, you know, how is, how is your walk with the Lord going, really? You know, how, uh, what, are you, what are you learning about God today? Uh, what, what practices, and do you need to start, and what practices do you need to stop? And so, I'm not sure about you, but I imagine you have friends in your life that confront you as well. And if you don't, I honestly, I feel for you. I, I actually hope that you do have friends. I hope that you, ha you do have friends that will wound you to your face. Because you really need that. So I wonder what, what's your response? If we, as we shift a little bit and we think about how to respond, what, what is your response when someone wounds you when a great friend says something to you that, that feels hurtful, what is your gut level response? Well, mine is defensiveness. I, you know, and I, I wonder, if, I bet you that's probably yours as well, but there's, there can be a response of defensiveness. You know, well, you don't know all the things that I'm actually good at, you know, um, that kind of a thing. There's sometimes justification that happens. Uh, my favorite one is counterattack. Like, oh, you know, you're actually bad at this too. There's just something that stirs up very naturally in us to counterattack. Um, here's a good one. Well, you got to discredit the source. You know, like, well, who are you to say that to me? Do you know 
how you live your life is pretty despicable, you know, and so let's discredit the source and that way the words aren't quite as hurtful. Uh, and an extreme reaction would be simply to break the relationship and just be like, you know what, we're done. We're done here. And I think a lot of us have these initial responses. And uh, unfortunately, I think a lot of us sometimes stay here in those responses. We stay in the defensive, in the justifying, in the discrediting, in the accusatory stance, and we don't move on. Relationships end. And I wonder sometimes if the broken relationship really is a result of the person who said the words or a, re and a result of the conflict itself, or is it more a result of the fact that we just have a hard time receiving challenging words? You know, we're talking about great friendships here. These are words that are spoken in the context of great friendships. These are not uh, words that are, are like outside accusations that are coming from strangers. Uh, we're not digging into relationships that have inappropriate power hierarchies. And so filter what we're talking about today, um, looking at these words through that particular lens. It's in the context of great friendships that we're talking about. Now, Paul and Barnabas were equals. Paul and Barnabas were equals. They were co-workers. And it's in this context that these words are spoken. They had an identical mission. They were going through life together. And so what do we need to take away from this great friendship between Paul and Barnabas? Well, number one is this. If you have a friend that is not experiencing the life that God has for them, is it possible that your God-given purpose or role in their life includes confrontation? Let me say that again. This is the first thing. If you have a friend that is not experiencing the full life that God has for them, is it possible that your God-given role in their life includes confrontation? James 5.20 says this in the New Living Translation, you can be sure that whoever brings the sinner back from wandering will save that person from death and bring about the forgiveness of many sins. You know, God wants us to follow him, but God also uses people to bring people back to himself. And so oftentimes, I've thought wrongly, well, they'll just let God sort that out with that person and, and they'll figure it out and they'll, they'll come around, so let's pray for them, and there's nothing wrong with that. However, it could very well be that God wanted me to actually talk to them and to help them come back. There's a number of biblical models for how to handle confrontation. I'd encourage you to look at Matthew chapter 18. But I think the genuine root of all this confrontation is a genuine, a deep, real love for the person that we're talking to. It's a desire to see them come to God. It's a desire to get them maybe out of a habit or way of living that's damaging to themselves or to others or to their relationships with people. That's where wounding from a friend comes from, a place of love, a place of compassion, a place of wanting them to succeed in life. It's, this is, this is a, an eyeball-to-eyeball eyeball type of conversation. This is not an Instagram post confrontation. This is not a vague book comment, you know, oh, so-and-so offended me, and everyone's wondering, was it me? I don't know. This is not a, hey, you know what? Me and my 14 friends saw this about you and think it's wrong. It's, it's not that. This is me telling you, my friend, we've got to sit down and talk about this. I love you. <laughs> and this is what I'm noticing, and this is difficult for me to say, and I hope that this doesn't affect our relationship. There's some risk involved, but there, this is what it's like. It comes from that place of love and compassion. That's the first thing. The second thing is this. If you are being confronted by a trustworthy friend, do you have the courage to hear what is being said, to evaluate your life, and to actually change? Let me say that one again. This is the second thing. If you are being confronted by a trustworthy friend, do you have the courage to hear what is being said, to evaluate your life, and to change? 
Are you willing to take it even further, I would say, and not only be willing to receive feedback from people, but do you actually even seek it out? Are you the type of friend who says, listen, I want to grow, I want to change, speak into my life. Tell me what I can do differently. And not sort of a like, hey, let me know if I'm going astray and, and then sort of casual thing, but like, no, 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 like right now, here and now, do you know, do you see something in me that, that I should be doing differently? Can you, right here and now, can you tell me what it is? I can take it. <laughs> you know, tell me what it is. Are you that type of person? Are you able to receive the feedback? You know, there's so many ways to say something wrong today. And I fear that good Christian, God-loving people are becoming more afraid to talk to their friends because they're worried about saying something the wrong way. And so if you are being confronted by a friend, it's very likely that they're going to say it to you imperfectly it's not going to be said exactly the way that it should. In fact, I don't even know if it's possible. So when you hear your friend challenge you in an appropriate, loving way, can you receive it? Can you receive it? You know, I think the Proverbs, the writer of Proverbs uses the words wounds intentionally because it hurts. And so to sum it up, are you willing to confront someone that you love out of a place of love and are you able to receive it? Can you, can you receive that correction? Can you receive that challenge? Can you give it? Can you take it? You know, ultimately God wants us to draw close to him. Ultimately God wants us to have a deep relationship with himself. We know from the scriptures that Jesus Christ died to forgive sinners. We know this from the word of God. We know that salvation is available to every person who hears the gospel and responds to it. But the people who come to Christ and seek forgiveness are those who are aware that they have something in their life that needs forgiving. And I think that sometimes we need great friends to point some of those things out in a loving way so that those people our friends, ourselves included, will come to God through Jesus Christ to get the forgiveness that we really need. It's part of the process. God has called each one of us to do our part, to lovingly challenge one another and to graciously receive challenges when they come and ultimately to bring all these things to God. To say, God, look at what this person said about me. Is it true? How do I change? What do I do? Lord, forgive me. I need your help. And if we're going to confront someone, God, I'm worried about bringing this word to this person. Can you, can you prepare their hearts? Can you give me the right words? Can you check my own motives, Lord? Where is this coming from? Do I really love them or am I just trying to get back, get revenge or something like that? It all is, is sustained and supported and happens best through prayer. And so I just want to encourage you today with these words. And I want to close in a word of prayer because maybe even hearing this today, you're remembering some friends that maybe you let go that you should have confronted or maybe you did confront them and you didn't think it went very well and they've departed from you. And maybe you're hearing this today and you've left a friendship because you felt like someone had hurt you. Well, I, we need to pray about these things. And we need to ask God to give us his spirit and give us the help that we need so we can do things right and we come back to our friends and ultimately we can have a great relationship with God. So let me pray. Lord, thank you so much for Paul and for Barnabas that these men are so human. Lord, they had this confrontation. I thank you that it's in the Bible. I thank, uh, thank you that in some ways it normalizes conflict. So Lord, I just pray that uh, anyone who has a friend who's departed them because of a, a um, confrontation, Lord, I pray that you would give the person who spoke the words the right way to bring them back and the person who heard the words, Lord, would you give them 
your spirit and, and reunite that friendship, Lord. Bring them back. Lord, for any one of us who are contemplating speaking a challenging word, I pray that you would guide us and help us, Lord, and create opportunities so this can happen in a constructive way. And Lord, I, I pray for myself, and I know for everyone who's listening, God, we need to, to learn how to receive constructive criticism. We need to learn how to receive the challenging words from, from others, Lord. W- we actually need to learn how to seek it out and not be afraid of it. Lord, we, we want to change. We want to become more like you, Jesus. And today we recognize that that happens partly through the words of our friends. And so, Lord, thank you. God, may everything that happens in our life be for your glory. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.